Okay, first of all, I'd like to welcome all of you here. Um, this is a wonderful space, and we're particularly grateful to Kimberly Dean and Julian Butterly. And um, they have, I think, done a marvelous job of hanging these paintings, which have never been seen before. And this is also the first time they've had a picture rail, and they've made this wall into a work of <laughs> geometric abstract art in itself. So uh, I think this is just a marvelous space to be holding this. And Kelly would have loved it because she was very much into meditation and serenity and beauty. And that's what we feel here tonight. So I'm going to take, talk a little bit about Carl Hesse, and then Barbara Colebrook Peace is going to read a few of Kelly's poems this time, and then we'll read her own here. Poem. Sorry. Come on, come on. <laughs> Bill Bissett apparently once was reading. Um, I haven't seen him anywhere. Was reading during um, a big event in Toronto, and somebody phoned him, so he just stopped the reading and answered the phone call, and then continued. So um, me, the two of you just, it's okay, just come and find a seat somewhere. Maybe these two? Yes, these yeah. are fine. You can put the shoes. Okay. You can put the shoes inside if you would like. Okay. Yeah. okay, so I'll just continue a little bit about Carl Hesse first. I got to know Carl when I was a high school student in Langley. Art was my favorite subject because it was the one that was the most fun. You didn't have to struggle with it. You just did this wonderful artwork. And I had a terrific teacher, John McTaggart, who made the whole experience really pleasurable. What I didn't know at the time was that John McTaggart was part of an art group together with Carl Hesse. And I knew Carl because he came into the restaurant where I worked part time while I was going to school. And if I remembered certain things, like whether or not he took two creamers with his coffee and brown bread instead of white bread, and prunes for dessert, he'd give me a quarter tip. Well, in those days, a quarter was a lot of money. Most people didn't tip. It wasn't that 15% rule that you have now. So I got to know him, and I, he invited me to his studio. He had a little commercial sign shop in the sort of poor end of town, and behind that was the studio. And when I went into the studio, I couldn't believe my eyes. This was, to me, the first real experience with great art. I truly, truly believe that. You know, I studied it in books, Van Gogh, and the Impressionists were my favorite, and so on. But when I saw this, I was just sort of stunned at how beautiful and wonderful it was, how strong. And there was one painting in particular that I liked, and he took it off the wall, and he gave it to me. And it's the first painting in this book. And um, let's see if I can find it quickly. <laughs> it's this painting here. He gave me this painting. It's quite a big painting. And in those days, his painting was a little bit more, you might say, romantic in nature, idyllic. He had just come back from some rather gruesome experiences. His wife and little girl were run over, I believe, by a Jersey milk farm's truck in uh, Vancouver, where he had a studio and commercial art um, shop. And so, um, because he was totally devastated by that, he moved up to Langley, and he would go prospecting on weekends uh, to get away from everything. And he went deep, deep into the BC wilderness, the Fraser Canyon, past any, anywhere that you know most people went. He was so natural out in the woods, and he was totally at home in the woods. And he'd bring back pigments, you know, minerals, because he was also a prospector, and he'd grind them up. And I remember him in his shop um, with a Bunsen burner, busy mixing up various <laughs> pigments. He used berry juice, too, and that's one of the poems is a little bit about that. And um, he actually, in those days, gave advice to Cloverdale Paint when, when Cloverdale Paint was just a small commercial operation in Cloverdale. Now it's everywhere. But he was a consultant. And he was able to do that because of his art training in Europe. He studied in um, Dresden at the Kunst Academy and at the Ecole de Beaux Arts in Paris. And one of his specialties was color and pigment and um, restoration work. 
I remember once he was actually restoring a ribbon from, I don't know who owned it now. <laughs> but you know, th this was a sort of background that I had with him. And I got to know him more and more because, as I said, I loved art. And he was an amazing man because he, he carried everything with him. You know, he, he didn't travel heavily, but he, everything was in his head. He told me stories about Homer and the Greek myths. I mean, he was very, very well educated over the years. So it had a very formative influence on my own life, and he encouraged me, of course, to study. And um, I remember my mother being quite angry with me once when I didn't have a com proper sense of commercial values. She said, well, it's really Carl who raised you. <laughs> so um, I, there, there are uh, stories about his earlier life. And had I known he was going to pass away dancing at a New Year's party in Spuzzin, B.C. at the Sasquatch Inn, I would have you know, made a list of everything that was relevant to his background. But I do know that he was put into a boarding school orphanage in Vienna and treated very cruelly. And so he ran away to Turkey, to Bulgarian Turkey. But he was caught and sent back to the orphanage, severely punished. And of course, he ran away again. This time, he ran away to the fishing boats. And there were other orphans working in the fishing boats. And he, he told me he remembered scaling fish in Arctic seas and things like that. Well, on the boats, he slowly worked his way up. And eventually, he, he, I think he got his second mate's ticket. It's a long story there, but anyway. And also, while he was on the boats, um, there was this one captain who was particularly sympathetic to him. And he would let Carl go off and study art you know, in Paris and so on. Um, whenever the, the opportunity was there so that he could uh, build up his own training. And um, later on he studied in Dresden, but then um, events, uh, political events happened and a lot of his fellow students got in trouble and he left. And again, of course, his stable was the boats. And once when he was um, docking in Spain, he got involved in the Spanish Civil War. I think the boat was... I don't know, confiscated or something like that. So he trained as a guerrilla fighter for about three months or something. And then he was captured by uh, the Moorish um, guards and imprisoned. And um, he escaped because he knew several languages. They gave him more freedom um, to translate letters and things like that. So he organized a small party and escaped. They stole a boat, escaped across to Africa. He ended back up in Canada, where he had been before the war for a short time. And so um, then, of course, the Second World War started, and he joined as part of the Canadian Armed Forces. But um, I, he suffered, I think, what you would now call post-traumatic stress syndrome very badly. Um, he was put to work doing things like clearing minefields and so on, one of the few survivors of that sort of experience. So he suffered a great deal, but he never showed it. He was a man with a great sense of humor. Um, and he could talk to anybody about anything. He didn't sort of cater to the hoi polloi of the arts community. Um, but he was very well loved by a lot of people. And as I said, he was part of a musician's group. As I found out later on that John McTaggart, my high school art teacher, was part of this group. Um, Carl played the piano very well, even though he never owned a piano and all the time I knew him. But if he'd go visiting somewhere and he'd see a piano, he'd say, oh, <laughs> I play your piano. And he'd play beautifully. And he'd often play for his supper at various menus in the Langley area. He exhibited in Vancouver um, at, at um, private art galleries. He had shows in Langley and as far abroad as London and England. So he was collectible at the time, but um, then after he passed away, because I had been collecting paintings ever since this first painting, all my life, then I inherited some of his paintings. But my own life carried on, so I wasn't able to um, do full justice. And so that's what I'm trying to do now, in a sense, with the Ed Hesse paintings. And so now we get to Kelly. Um, Kelly was a very dear friend of mine, a fellow medievalist. She was interested in medieval manuscripts, and I studied for my doctorate medieval manuscripts at Munich. 
And um, she wrote an article, even though she was only an undergraduate, on one particular manuscript about a woman, and that's per perhaps relevant today because it's Women's Day. Um, Marjorie Kemp was a medieval mystic. And she was given to great bouts of crying. You know, that was a sign that the spirit was moving in you. She had, I think, something like 14 children. And then, perhaps not too surprisingly, she thought, well, you know, I'd kind of like to live a chaste life now and be holy. <laughs> so she had a lot of visionary experiences, particularly after the birth of her first child, religious experiences. And she went on pilgrimage to Jerusalem and, and various places. People weren't too fond of her because she had these great bouts of crying. And, you know, she would um, suddenly come out with spiritual thoughts and so on. But anyway, um, what Kelly did was she examined the only surviving copy of the original copy of this manuscript. And it was owned at Mount Grace Priory. And in the margins, somebody had written in red ink various comments like, um, when Marjorie was crying, the commentator would write, and so did Father so-and-so, you know. Uh, so it was a response to what was going on. And where the virgin <coughs> smock is mentioned, you know, it was a holy relic, of course, which uh, Marjorie had seen in Aachen, um, the commentator drew a little bit, a little picture of the virgin smock. Now, Fellow monks wouldn't have been so interested in that. So what Kelly kind of promoted was the idea that this, product, this manuscript was probably used for, but with the community, you know, as community outreach, and that women probably were also involved in this manuscript. And some places where there's men something something something, the, this this red ink annotator would give a little carrot and say, and women. So there was a connection with probably with women in the community with this manuscript. Now, Mar um, Kelly's article was published, and today it is still the authoritative um, article on the Red Ink Annotator of the Marjorie Kemp manuscript. So Kelly had many, many talents, and I always thought she would have made a good professor at one of the top universities in the world in medieval studies. But, um, she did leave this one important article and, of course, her poems. So first of all, we're going to have Barbara Colebrook piece, and she's going to read a few of Kelly's poems, and then read her own poem, which is on page 108, afterwards when you want to look and follow her reading, okay? So it's an honor for me to read Kelly's poems. Um, she was a very close friend. Uh, she and I began writing together about the same time in our lives and um, got to know each other through writing. And um, we shared a lot in poetry. And her work is extraordinary. So it's really an honor for me to be reading it. Um, I'm going to read the first poem in her book, which is about her dog. She had a dog that she loved very much, and it's called How the Dog. How the dog is dog white. How he opens himself to the world each day, every morning the same, empties himself, then drinks. How his black pads and variegated claws click the pavement exactly in time with the barefoot version of Ode to Joy. And he means it. <laughs> How in the dignified winter of his life he's so willingly your child. How the dog recovers. How his heart is an unsealed document and he writes upon it daily. How inside his small body is a great hall, a library of smells in which you've been permanently shelved. How the dog forbears. How the dog goes about doing the work of dog. How the dog 
unmirrors you. How the dog is dog quiet, sprawled on a pile of clothes. And how the dog allows. Here's violin, when you throw yourself across the bed for effect, whimpering again in that strange human accent you have. When you're down there, trying to tell the dog about your life, how the dog's best music is listening. And this is a poem she wrote when the um, monks from Tibet came to the art gallery of Greater Victoria. And um, she was one of a group of people who, who helped um, make soup for them. And uh, uh, it's called Monks at the Table. Shaved heads, beautiful and bent over butter sculptures and sand mandalas at the art gallery of Greater Victoria. Their robes are saffron and Tibetan red, their socks and shawls dyed to match. Nick, Jean, Kamala and I have climbed the four long flights of stairs and will wait in this heritage attic for the monks to make the slow climb, take their seats at the table. Soon we'll serve them soup under these eaves. And too late I'll discover it's the worst borscht I've ever made. But okay, I can let even this go. Because the monks nod and smile, say, say no to more borscht, laugh and smile, and we all smile and laugh, and their fine, easy manners, their joined palms. We all bow, and bowing, one of them asks, do you have many snows here? And because the monks are here, chanting now for the midday meal, <coughs> their octave buzzing our bodies, a drone so mountain moving in, and I can't say anything, which is to say, dear sound, come inside, never leave. Judy La tells us the monks like to watch Jackie Chan movies, drink coke, eat pizza. The plight of their people the plight of their people. This afternoon someone will take them to the movies and will find out how Windhorse made Rinpoche cry. How where they come from, even no to Borscht means yes. Their knees touched under the table. And the last one I'll read is special to me because Kelly and I um, went up to Long Beach uh, to Vino for a writing retreat there together. And um, <coughs> we discovered the beach together. Um, I've been there before, but I discovered it in a new way through Kelly. And she wrote this poem about the beach there called The Beach from the Beach, uh, which is starts with a, a quotation from the Japanese poet Basho, who said, learn about the pine from the pine. Learn about the bamboo from the bamboo. So that's why she called it the beach from the beach. The drive through the painting to get there, leaving all the books unopened. Small snail on the wet handrail, Moss left to grow, the whole beach to ourselves. Waves that know themselves as water, walking all morning next to this. The tide has drawn stalks of celery in the sand, pale green families. Does Basho have a beach? because I know that beach. So those are Kelly's poems.
And um, mine that I wrote in memory of him sort of follows on from that last poem I read you because it's about um, stopping at Cathedral Grove on the way up to Long Beach. And uh, this painting over here by Carl um, reminded me of Cathedral Grove. So it's the one that I took as inspiration for this poem. Oh, uh, it's on page 108, and the painting's on page 109. And whenever I go up to Cathedral um, Grove now, I always stop there on my way to Long Beach and think of Kelly, remember her, as I'm walking through the trees. I can see her because she was very much a tree person. And uh, so I can still see her there. So in this poem, I'm speaking to Kelly after she died. Cathedral Grove. Whenever you arrive in my thoughts, bringing a memory of home, the beach, hospice, does some trace of you where you are now reach from beyond this earth and sun and moon? You love the connection between one being and another. Your face, when you stop to look in a tide pool, full of tenderness and curiosity and awe. You told me your favorite word was and. From you I learned to notice small creatures, the snail on the wet handrail, the beetles' tracks in the sand. Now you are gone and I try to notice them on my own. I scatter your ashes, here where the earth lies still and rich in loam, may you find the wind and green them. This forest was your face, in the place beyond time where you were born. was the connection between Carl and Kelly. It, it's that, um, like um, Dorothy Field in here, um, I gave her some copies of some of these abstracts so that she could meditate on them and maybe write some poems on them. But because of her illness, she wasn't able to do that. And so this is how this book came about. Fellow poets like Barbara and a number of others in this book, and those who knew of her poetry, um, agreed to finish her project. So some of them wrote poems directly related to Kelly, as Barbara did, and some wrote poems on the paintings, which is sort of what Kelly might have done. And what I found interesting about the whole project was that although the poets didn't sort of connect with each other during this process, they all picked up some aspect of Kelly or most particularly Carl, um, whether it was mythological, um, to do with the creative process. Um, it didn't matter what it was, but it all was somehow there. And it formed a, a group, a unity, which was you know, quite miraculous in a way. And um, I'm not sure that all of you will um, see the same things in these paintings, but as you may remember from an article lately about Kerner, the poet, um, he said, you know, something to the effect that there are many ways of reading, um, uh, many interpretations of a painting, and I think they're all valid. And so, you know, if you encounter something like an abstract, it's very like, in some ways, a medieval spiritual exercise because you bring yourself to it. Whereas if you have a naturalistic painting of cows in a field, well, that's what it is. But 
abstract paintings sometimes reach deeper than that, especially if there's something there to begin with. And so we had some absolutely wonderful poems in this book by such very, very talented people. And one of these, of course, is Judith Heron. And um, hers start on page 110. Um, so if you turn there, you see the corresponding um, painting. I think it's up here somewhere, too. I don't know where it is right now. And then she'll read from um, 112. With her. Um, when I read her book, I read a lot of poetry. Um, it had it stir Kelly's work stirred me the way Gary Snyder did in the seventies. Um, the a simplicity, um, a truth, um, a spareness. Um, and I would like to indulge you, you to join me in indulging in. And I have a need to read a poem of Kelly's first. I mean. And it was the one, um, when I was reading her book in preparation for the reading on Wednesday, I was <coughs> awed that I thought this poem did a grander job of speaking to the Hesse painting than my own. So, <laughs> so I want to read it with that in mind. If you see the picture on one, Eleven, listen first to Kelly's poem. <laughs> Big Sky Mind. You open your six sense doors and the heart reaches for the four corners of the ten directions throughout space and time to the emptiness that is night sky. The place where no heart can be held with words and you sit down in the middle of this unknowing and your heart knits itself a bright cap embroidered with little dark stars. <laughs> so likewise, I'm, um, the discoveries that happen after a project um, I surprised myself with the title of this, and I had to, because it was written some years, was it three or so years ago, I had to remember what I'd meant when I titled this The Valley of Acre. And um, when you were speaking of Kelly's medieval interest in Akan, um, I suddenly felt this knitting together of how it had come that I had chosen this. And my brief notes to assist me in entering this poem say that the Valley of Achor is in fact a valley near Jericho. And it has become known as a proverbial expression for that which caused trouble. In Isaiah, it's described as a place for herds to lie down. That which has been a source of calamity would become a source of blessing. And in Hosea, it's uh, referred to as the trouble would be turned into joy, despair into hope, a doorway of hope to pardon Israel. I am not Buddhist as as Kelly seemed much interested in, but I am full of faith. And her work touches me at the deepest place where all faith is one. And um, that Kelly represents to me and her work in the world um, the embodiment, and as she lived and died, the embodiment of trouble turned to joy. So the Valley of Acorn. The Valley of Acre. The darkness, so like the hundred year forest. Primitive longings paw toward light where space bursts with remembered radiance. Yeah, one more. Um, and I was very drawn to just, when I looked at these drawings, to just make these spare little marks on the page. 
not usually like me, as you could imagine by the way I'm talking. Um, but I still stay with that. This is in, in the way that art speaks to something primal. So this one, when I looked at it, again my upcountry roots say to me, oh, the forest and the woods, and look at that water just spilling down. And so I simply call it in the midst of anything. In the midst of anything, water, clear and eternal, falls as it always has. And now, thank you. It's, it's funny how things grow together and become something new, and I sort of feel that's been happening. So next we have Gray Sutherland, who's um, together. Who's very shy. <laughs> Over there in the corner. Who's playing the mandolin when he came in. Um, Gray is part of my painting group. We do Chinese brush painting together with Yuriko Hammer, who's back there. And we've known each other for a number of years. And actually, I think Gray wrote the first poems for, that ended up in the Kelly book. And he's got a number of them. And they start on page 54. So here is Gray Sutherland, who's a multi-talented person. And he's getting a little embarrassed, so I'll just let him come up here. Oh, shucks, guys. Come on, give me a break already. <laughs> Oh, how, how am I supposed to follow that, eh? Oh, almighty. Well, I met Kelly once. She gave me a copy of her little book, which I thought was lovely. And then I went back to see her again, and she wasn't there. Um, and Mady gave me a, a copy of her book of Carl Hess's um, pictures, and they just sort of sank in, and I chewed and chewed and chewed and chewed and chewed and digested for a long, long, long time. And she came up with the idea, hey, put some poems together with these things. And the process of whatever you want to call it, you, know, you can call it meditation, you can call it digestion, you can call it whatever the heck, um, continued. And then, peculiarly enough, one morning in Rome, of all places, I sat down on the bed in the room I was staying in, got out my notebook, and wrote the whole lot down in one second, just <laughs> Which meant to me, one, that it was real, two, that it was absolutely un un inimitable, and three, it's typical Sutherland nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so here we go. Um, this is in valleys of fractal stone, but it's in valleys of fractal stone shadows beckon, one to another calling me ever on, into that secret core within where light, love, Life are just reflections of the gleaming dance of solemn trees. I've been there, seen the fractured planes of light soaring between mountain sides, heard the stone tingle in nervous delight as stars rise above cruel peaks into the night skies. I've been there, watched life flicker instant by ecstatic instant between shivering pine needles and heard water trickle somewhere beyond the darkness, always beyond. You got that one, didn't yes. you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This one was, um, comes out of the picture. There's no way out of it. It's called Early Morning Tremor. And as we watched a finger twisted, fierce and muscular from the ground, Feet cracked and scarred in broken sandals, as if the mountainside itself had swelled. And as it glared at us, its eyes blazing with malevolent rage, its breath snarling through clamped teeth, the sky shuddered, rocks cowered, rivers fell silent, trees and flowers cringed, all living beings fled behind their shadows, and the whole valley shook its eyes closed in tight terror waiting until at last the creature spoke. Of what it said, we understood not a word. 
and yet its mocking sneer left its meaning clear next time. And this is the night riders. Within my fancy's peace, without the myriad riders howl in frustrated rage, within my fence I have gathered wife, children, friends, those whom I wish to protect from the swirling smoke. Without the flames roar higher, the riders hiss and snarl, while within all is calm. Got two little more. Just like the laugh of an exultant child discovering the truth its parents <laughs> cannot see. Yeah. And if you look closely, eyes almost closed, hold your breath tight, start to hum silently and sway, sway, just like a hemlock in February wind. Nothing may happen, but at least you know you're on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> something beyond and um, that's quite moving well the last poet today is Karen Ballinger and um, she has been helping me promote this event and she's been helping with food treats which you'll have afterwards and um, she has responded to a number of poems which are um, particularly relevant also to Carl the first one is on picking blueberries, and all she knew was that Carl sometimes made pigments out of berries, because as I said, you know, he knew how to mix color from scratch. He was very interested, by the way, in the methods of medieval artists, especially for oil paintings, which we don't have any oil paintings here, um, not as such, on display. But um, he, I remember him picking berries, with blueberries, blackberries. He also made juice out of them, and he thought it was marvelous because with the blackberries, you didn't have to pay for them. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess Karen Bellinger is going to start with picking blueberries on page 66. And there's a few poems there that I think kind of resonate with Women's Day today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I wanted to mention about the, my daughter reminded me when she came, I wanted to mention about the blueberries. When we lived in New Brunswick, we were allowed to go and pick blueberries after the commercial pickers had already done it. And they have different type of blueberries there. They're lower, and they would rake them. And then what was left, you would be allowed to go and pick. So we did that every year. It was kind of a ritual. In July, we always went and picked blueberries. And my son was born in July. So that's why it appears in this poem. I was out picking blueberries and had to stop and breastfeed him. <laughs> Picking blueberries on the barrens, hot August afternoon, suckling my month-old son. Blueberries, blue fairies, fairy blue cats, blueberries on the barren. The next one is on page 68. Sorry, I should have to say page 66. Page 68. Sun rises, a new laid egg, still warm under speckled feathers, I reach under, crack open the truth. <coughs> and the next one, this one really reminded me of a lodge, much like the lodges that you see up around um, Camels, where they're, they're underground, they're beautiful, First Nations lodges there. Full moon seeks the edge, I dance in the lodge, Gaia, Gaia, Gaia grounds our future in her hands. And then the last one. Inside the lean-to, my stained fingers winnow. Fresh leaves, twigs from fat blueberries on a small cedar plank. 